Welcome, my friends. I'm Dave Champion. This is my co-host, Bill Carnes, and together we are totally, totally unprepared. unprepared. <laughs> you, me. You know what? It's, uh, we're we're going to talk about the NSA. Yes. Which is, uh, stands for No Strings Attached, a government agency. They can do pretty much whatever they want. They, everything they do is uh, behind the curtain of national security, which means yep. it's untouchable by the courts. They are unregulated. They are between seven and ten times the size of the CIA. Yep. Um, their entire <clears throat> mission statement is to spy on all things American interest. Yeah. Far more of that's within our borders than outside. And they are a military organization. Um, a lot of people are confused because they see, like, director of NSA appearing before Congress wearing a suit and tie. Um, it, it is a military organization. <clears throat> it is run by the military. It is... Um, created under Title 50 of the United States Code, which is deals with military matters. Um, it is for foreign espionage. It, it actually came out of World War II and all of the, uh, the desire to get the enemy's codes and break the enemy's codes and create codes that they could not break if they obtained them, <coughs> Excuse me, which was part of what they used to call the Army Signal Corps. And at the end of World War II, they, they realized, having... Having gotten the edge in numerous engagements because we broke the codes of our adversaries, the Enigma machine for the Germans, mm -hmm. whatever it was for the Japanese, I forget. The, the military <clears throat> code, the naval military code. Correct. Having had the advantage of having broken those codes, they realized how important that was. That was the genesis after World War II of NSA, which today, of course, is, if I were to use the term mammoth or gargantuan, it would not even begin to scratch the surface. But really what brought it to our attention today was there's an article published that now the, the, there's many civil libertarians that are raising the issue. Apparently this, they just found, that, that found out the FBI has this ability. The FBI looks at whatever criteria it requires. Obviously, we're talking about counterintelligence and national security. And it says to the NSA, we need to look at your collection of international emails, international phone calls, and other forms of international communication pertaining to, and for the sake of this, I'll, I'll use you as an example, pertaining to Bill Carnes. And Not much to <clears> find. And so the NSA looks in its little rule book, and I'm, I'm sure it's, it's like, looks in its rule book, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and it says, Amido Cristo Santo, you have permission to look at our, our records, and then what happens from there, Bill? Well, rather than allowing the records to be looked at for the one person of interest, yes. what they do is they're giving you an open portal to look in their entire database and trusting the FBI to just look at the one person. Right. So literally what happens is the FBI gets permission from NSA to, to search the database. We'll, we'll say it's an email database. for the <laughs> Snack time. <clears throat> we'll call it, they say it's the email database. Okay. And yes, they have an identifying number for you. And they can go in and search for those. But there's nothing stopping them from searching for any records they want while they're in there. Uh, there is something <clears throat> stopping them from doing that. They're not supposed to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there is no so, mechanism in place to stop them. How's that? No, no legal mechanism in place. They're not supposed to go beyond that. And the FISA court is the one that allowed the rules change to do this. Yes. And uh, FISA, for those in our audience who don't know, stands for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Of which 1978. Was 78, yeah. 78. I don't think a lot of people are aware that, that FISA has, the, the FISA court, that's the one that gets all the media. It's, right. The, the, the FISA Act, which is what the A stands for, is that the FIS Act? <laughs> <laughs> um, most people aren't particularly aware of that. What they hear in the news all the time is the FISA court, FISA court, FISA court. So that's all they really know. <clears throat> Contrary me. to popular belief, it's not actually a court. It's not. It's probably an office with a guy that they call a FISA judge. Hey, judge, check it out. Can you take a look at this? Well, they actually do have a FISA chamber, okay, the, a judge's chamber. Hopefully it used to be a gas chamber that they can reaffect. Well, the reason they created one is, is not because it's a real court. And it's not. We're going to get into that in a minute. Um, the reason they created the FISA court environment is because they're hearing, you know, top secret, classified, compartmentalized, eyes only, all this stuff, that levels of classified data, and they don't want anybody else to know it. So they've built this, in, like, CIA briefing room that serves as a courtroom. Yeah, it's probably inside the center of a building, which has uh, all kinds of security on the outside and perimeter and yes, and light like, noise around the exterior. The whole and, drill, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, 
It's the FISA court is the one that basically says, we're going to tell you what the rules of the game are. And I think a lot of Americans are misled because they imagine that, by the way, there's, I forget how many judges, there's like 12, a dozen, something like that. It's been a while since I looked at it. Probably a good gig. That have been assigned as judges to the FISA court. Yep. And yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure there's a hefty bonus that goes with serving on the FISA court. Sure. Handpicked, now, probably by the president. I think a lot of people imagine when they hear FISA court, it's just like, say, the United States District Court or one of the United States Courts of Appeals, you know, the Sixth Circuit or the Ninth Circuit or the Tenth yeah, Circuit. They, they like imagine that. some form of the federal court <laughs> yeah, system. real courts, okay? Um, and nothing could be further from the truth. Now, I think it's important for the audience to understand the distinction. A real court, let's say the government's coming after you, and, no, I don't mean Knight County. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you mean the federal government's coming yeah, after you. Yeah. I moved up in the world. <clears throat> and... They're doing something which is violative of your rights. Viol they're violating their own, they're exceeding their own authority, so to speak. A real court can reach out to the Constitution, look at it, and say, uh uh, government, you can't do this. You're in the wrong because you have rights <clears throat> and the Constitution is there to constrain the government. And that's what we commonly call a, an Article Three court, exactly derived so. under Article Three of the U.S. Constitution, correct? Yes, yes. The judicial authority. It, it, right. It the Article Three defines the United States Supreme Court. It just speaks of its, I think, five different authorities, um, and then it's always been presumed, although it doesn't specifically say that, it's always been presumed under under Article Three, the federal government could create additional, like entry level courts to like hear the district courts. Con yeah, to hear controversies of federal law. Okay. So these are Article Three courts, and these are these are typically what are called re, you know real judges. Okay, uh, but not everything that is called a court is really a court. <laughs> a good example that most people would be familiar with, which was news to me actually, is a bankruptcy court. Correct. Now, <clears throat> when I say it's not a real court, people are like, what do you mean by that? Well, we just talked about all the real courts are created under Article Three of the uh, of the Constitution. Article one, of course, is what? That is the legislative. legislative. Right. So the legislature, <clears throat> excuse me, the legislature can create courts under its Article I power. Well, they're not they're not real courts in that case. Article real courts are under Article Three. Right. Okay. Article I courts are special limited jurisdiction tribunals that are not real courts. They can't reach out to the Constitution to determine what's right and wrong. They're entire frame of reference, their entire compass, if you legal compass, involves the law that created it. Nothing more. Very nothing narrowly less. defined. Very narrow. Which therefore would, would ask, it would beg the question, can they find anybody in an Article I court criminally liable no. in any sort? No. Or is this completely civil based on the law that it created it? Completely civil. Um, some other examples of Article I courts. Um, the tax court. Um, all the government did, it, I should go back and say, before there was a tax court, there was the United States Board of Tax Appeal that had existed, I don't know, 50 years, something like that. And then in 1972, Congress waved its magic wand and said, we're going to call the tax court now. They took the, the, the people who sat, I think they were called commissioners, if I remember correctly, who sat on the United States Board of Tax Appeals, <clears throat> and they simply put them in black robes, and they got rid of the table where they all sat. <laughs> they built a dais, and they put one guy with a robe up there. And the law literally said, the law passed 1972 said, the United States Board of Tax Appeals continuing as <laughs> the United States Tax Court. Okay? It, it's no different. These are administrative tribunals that the government has given the word, the title, court to. It's like me deciding I want to call you from now on. You're, you're going to be uh, a duke. I'd rather be a count. You want to be a count? All right. Count, yeah. Because I call you a count doesn't make you a count. And that's exactly what Congress has done with these courts. It, it calls them courts, but in reality, for the sake of people who really want to understand the truth, they're administrative tribunals. So what we have in this particular case, getting back to the FBI and the NSA, is you have an Article I, very narrowly defined court yes. called the FISA court. Right. Which is created under Article 50, which deals with the military. Everything in Article, I was not Article 50, Title 50 of the United States Code. Everything in Title 50 of the United States Code deals with military defense and national security. Right. Okay. So, yeah, this Article 1 court that has provided the 
FBI, which is under the judicial, I'm sorry, through, through the Department of Justice. Yes, it's the a, executive branch under the Department of Justice. The Bureau of the Department of Justice. And gave them the authority to go to NSA, which is operating under a military doctrine. Correct. A non-uniform military service. Yes. Um, yeah, you guys can, you know, go up there and just ask. You can get what you want. Yeah. In NSA, you are mm -hmm. ordained to give that to the FBI. It's all and, good. You know, the FBI, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what's going on. <clears throat> the FBI has legitimate counterintelligence function and it has a legitimate national security function. I mean, it's a very, very small part of the FBI's overall mission. Obviously a critical part, though, nonetheless. Um, so when, it, when the FBI goes to NSA and says, we need a particular piece of information concerning international communications, there's nothing wrong with that per se. The problem is that it, it, it's like saying, I, I need to get that chicken right there in, in the chicken coop. And it isn't, okay, here's the chicken. It's just go around, open the door and walk in. And get, yeah, just, go, go look go, for that chicken. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, all the chickens are in there. Just do whatever you want once you're in the chicken house. W wait a second. And <clears throat> we already know what happened with the, the spying that was done post 9-11. Domestic spying, right? The federal courts eventually declared it unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. It was just the executive branch doing whatever Congress permitted it to do until the courts called it in check. Right. And now what we've got is the federal government is, is absolutely doing the same thing. Right. They've just classified it under national security so the courts can no longer touch it. Right. Which is why the NSA, under the military branch, is doing that. And the FBI can then access it. So all they did was they just rerouted the whole thing. Yes. The same stuff is going on. Everything is still being collected. Yeah. It's and now it's easier for them to access, and we can't fight it. Right. It, the, the people who in my point in talking about that the prior efforts were declared unconstitutional, the domestic spying, is to show that the executive branch will do whatever the executive branch can get away with, even though it's illegal, even though it's unconstitutional, even though it's violative of all of our rights, the executive branch will do it anyway until it's caught on the carpet. So we, we know, now that they know that, we look at what NSA is allowing them to do. What, what, what can the, has the presumption have to be? Nothing. They're doing it again. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're doing nothing to stop it. We'll be right back. We are back, and now it's time for... What is up with people creating fantasy stories to support what they want to be true politically? I'll give you an example. Now, before I... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the T word, Trump. But before I get into it, let me, let me just say, there's nobody out there that I think is, is, is even remotely presidential material. So the fact that I'm talking about Trump is only indicative of the people that are following Trump or saying a particular thing. If I wanted to talk about Sanders, if I wanted to talk about Clinton, it would be just as ugly. So let me be clear about that. I'm not attacking one candidate over the other. They're all crap. Now, here's what I've noticed with Trump supporters. I have said to them that Trump is running a reality TV campaign. Now, so are the other ones, okay? You look at Hillary's campaign, it's a freaking mess, right? It, it, it just lies after lies, after misrepresentation, after mischaracterizations. She says whatever she wants people. If this group, she, she needs to say A to get there to support, she says A. If to this group, she needs to say the exact opposite, which is B, she says B to them. It doesn't matter. But I've said to people concerning Trump that he's running a reality TV uh, campaign. He learned how to make Trump popular via reality TV. And now he's parlayed that into a presidential campaign, which is the most incredibly damning thing for our American political system, that a guy is getting the overwhelming support from one of the two dominant parties in America because he's running a uh, reality TV campaign. Just incredibly damning to the voters. That speaks of the voters. So I say to people, as he's running around doing this reality TV show, masquerading as a campaign, he's saying, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to show them, and I'm going to do... And I say, if one understands the Constitution, and one understands the executive power, and one understands that the president does not make law at all, 
All he does is he raises his right hand and he commits to faithfully execute the laws of the union. That is part of his oath, faithfully execute the laws of the union. Other than that, he, and he's the commander in chief of the military. But obviously, the vast majority of things that Trump has said have nothing to do with him being commander in chief. It's just in his role as the president. And he says all these things he's going to do. And then when you look at what he's allowed to do, what the law permits, it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I tell them he won't do any of those things. He can't. Because in order for him to do those things that he's saying on the campaign trail, his reality TV show masquerading as a campaign, he would have to be a dictator, not a president. So I explain this to Trump supporters. And I've gotten the most odd response. And the response is, oh, no, no, no. He's going to have the support of Congress on all this. Oh, do tell. Please explain to me how this is going to happen. Well, after Trump gets in, all the other politicians in Congress, they're going to understand that if they don't get with the program and, and support Trump, they're out the next election. Hence the fantasy tale I started by describing. And it's not my way typically to be rude and tell somebody, you know, look, you've lost your mind. This is a complete fan. This is the Harry Potter, Harry Potter version of politics. Yep. Harry Potty pants. Harry, yeah. <laughs> so rather than say that, I, I just sort of shake my head and walk away. But the question is, is, is this claim true that all the politicians are going to fall in line behind Donald Trump? Well, let's look at how that could possibly happen. We've all heard people say that a politician is won by such a great margin that he has a mandate from the people, and that all the other politicians are supposed to fall in line with his agenda because the people, over ele the people elected him with such an overwhelming majority. Mandate from the people. But that's not going to happen. Right now, the polls show that if it was Trump versus Hillary, Hillary would become president. That's what the polls are showing now. So let us say that they're, they're wrong and Trump becomes president. You can still pretty much bet it would be 51%, 50.5% or 51%, something like that, okay? There, there's no overwhelming victory there. There's no mandate. So the idea that, he, that all the other politicians in Congress are going to have to fall into a line behind Trump or pay the price of the next election, we can't use the people mandate thing because that's not going to happen. That, that's, again, part of the fantasy tale. So the only other way that this would happen would be that his, he was so wildly popular. Well, again, that's going to be reflected in the vote, and we just covered that. Okay? It's not going to happen. Then we look at what's really happened in the past. Okay? Um, if, we take from, if we move forward from the end of the New Deal era forward, well, the scenario that they're describing has never, ever happened once. <laughs> <laughs> it's never been a case where a person became president by such an overwhelming majority, and everybody who opposed him just said, oh, well, he won by an overwhelming majority. We have to follow. It's never happened, not once, ever. Okay? Now, they, people have won by greater or lesser majorities, but never has the other side just fallen to their knees and, and capitulated. It's never happened. In like 80 years, it's never happened. So where is this fantasy coming from? What really happens is this. Um, in 2014, as an example, the approval rating for Congress from the American people was 11%. And in that year, 96% of congressional incumbents who were up for re-election were re-elected. 11% approval rating, 96% re-elected. Okay. Does that sound to you like any house cleaning is going on? And depending on whose numbers you, you believe, anywhere from 85% to 92% are reelected every single election. Uh, the congressional, uh, whoever's Congress uh, representatives in the House or senators, depending on who you're paying attention to, 85 to 92% of them are sent back every single election. Okay? So where is this fantasy coming from? that every, all, the, all the opposition to Trump is going to fall to its knees. And by the way, I would say when it comes to Trump, since he is clearly not a part of the, the mainstream Republican uh, agenda, when he, should he become president, he's going to face opposition from a, virtually every single Democrat. 
And I'm here to tell you from a good percentage of establishment Republicans. So he's going to have, it's not going to be a 50-50 split. It's going to be more like a 70-30 split or maybe even an 80-20 split against him when he's sitting in the, in, in the White House, if that comes to pass. So I, I'm not suggesting, because they're all crummy choices, <laughs> I'm not suggesting that anybody vote for Trump or not vote for Trump based on reality, which I'm presenting, or the fantasy tale that many of his supporters are offering. I'm simply saying, understand the truth. If you want to vote for the reality TV guy, okay, but understand he's going to do exactly zero of the things that he's claiming, nothing. And he's going to have more than the usual opposition that any other Republican candidate would have if elected president. Bill? So let's talk about one of the statistics we had there, 11% approval rating of Congress. That means 89% of the voting population says you guys suck. Right. And by no means in any sort of test is 11% acceptable passing anything other than an absolute, complete, and utter failure. Yep. But they don't care. It's like F minus, 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 minus. <laughs> because we still have more than 90% of them going back every two yeah. years. That there's an election cycle. Yeah. And it, it's you, not my guy, it's the leadership. And it's you not know, my guy, it's, it's president. Perhaps better than I do, you, you know that when they arrive in Congress, the entire emphasis from day one, whether they intended it or not, because now they're part of a team, right? Whether, whether, whether they intended it personally or not, from day one, the agenda is get the money and get reelected. So, I mean, you, you take a look at these congressmen. I mean, I'm sure you've seen some of the testimony of these <laughs> freshman congressmen who've done a term or two and then gone back home, and they talk about what, is, what the leadership demands of them when they arrive in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, one guy was saying uh, he was commanded by leadership to spend five hours a day on the phone fundraising. Mm -hmm. He said, and one of the reasons he left is he said, he said, I spent more time fundraising for the Republican Party than I did serving the interests of my constituents. It, it, not so much the Republican Party, for the uh, Republican caucus to reelect themselves. The leadership yes. cast. Okay. Yes. Right. Good clarification. And I, I mean, our freshman congressman out of Congressional District 4 here in Nevada, where we live, Crescent Hardy, I know him. And he and I were just chatting, I don't know, about four weeks ago. And uh, I asked him, I said, you know, you've, you've gone your first full year. What do you think? And he says, you know what, it's, it's nothing like what I expected it to be before sure. I got there. And this guy, uh, he has some experience in doing some legislative things. He was on the city council in Mesquite, Nevada. He represented his district in the assembly at the state level. Okay. But uh, he says completely different ball game back in D.C. So I said, is it better or worse? He says, just different, just all around different. I don't know if I could actually call it better or worse, just, just different. Playing with the big boys now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's big money on the table. There is. And when it comes to this whole thing with Trump, I, I actually have a friend of mine, um, and we've known each other for four or five years now, who's been a big supporter of Ron Paul and Rand Paul, and he's now all over Trump. Okay. I mean, like flies on stink. I don't know how it works out. From I don't Ron get Paul it. to Trump? It, you know, his. from what I'm gathering from him, it's just a great big um, flip in the birds of the establishment. That's his whole thing. Flip well, the bird of the establishment. That's a lot of now, the appeal of Trump. Another friend of mine who is incredibly liberty-minded has said regardless of who the Republican nominee is, he's voting for Hillary because he believes a Hillary president will take us so a presidency will take us so far over the edge we'll end up in uh, some sort of an, uh, a civil uprising in the country, and he really wants to kick that off. Now, this is a younger guy yeah. who wants to kick it off, and I looked at it and I said... What makes you think I want to put myself or my kids at risk of something like this because you want to vote for Hillary so that you can engage in some form of uh, it's okay civil war? Right. Of sorts. It's an interesting concept. Interesting, to say the least. Anyhow, my buddy that, that has, is huge Trump, I mean, we talk regularly about all the holes that come out of uh, Trump's theories and things he's done. I mean, he didn't endorse Mitt Romney in 2012 uh, easily. Um, and in 2008, he gave money to Hillary Clinton four times during the primary season before she bowed out. 
before he ever gave anything over to um, John McCain, hedging his bets. Right. So, and that's, oh, well, you know, his response is, well, he wanted to have power, or, or influence, rather. Yeah. Okay, so he's hedging his bets on influence to the left before right. the conservative ideas, yeah. right? Only, only when the left failed to, to pan out for him did he right. switch his support to the right. Well, and I wouldn't even call it right or conservative because we're talking about McCain yeah. and Romney, who are <laughs> <laughs> horrible. Establishment but, uh, Republicans. How's yeah, that? establishment Republicans that are just uh, not doing what they need to do. Anyhow, enough of that. We'll be back right after this. It's pet peeve day. Let's see what happens. You know what really grinds my gears? Cutesy stupidity. It really does. Let me give you an example. Hey, you know, can you give me a hand? The response is... <laughs> Seriously? That's cutesy stupidity. I mean, if, if the brakes were completely taken off and it was uh, purge time, I'd shoot you in the face with a 12-gauge. If it was purge day. I'd, or if you did that, I'd wait for purge day and I'd blast you in the face with a 12 gauge. I would. That is so stupid. Please, please, please. And you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to mention these things because oftentimes my friends, actual friends that are out there, will watch these segments, see these things that just really drive me insane. And then they'll do them over and over. It's like, you know what? You're really looking for a pipe to the shin doing that. Like the whole thing, I don't like being called Mr. Bill. Mr. Bill is a Saturday Night Live puppet character. I don't resemble that at all. Because my name is Bill and he's Mr. Bill? Seriously? I said, hey, Mr. Bill, <laughs> thinking they're cute. I want to take a pipe to your shin. Stop it. All of you. Same thing with this. <laughs> That's so unoriginal. Come on. If you're going to do something, make it original. Make it funny. Be a coin it. Patent it. Something. But stop the clapping for a hand. Can I get a hand? Really? There's just... So many ridiculous things that people are like, oh, yeah, sure, let me, let me help you out. What am I supposed to do? Rephrase my question? Can you please provide me some assistance? You know, what are you going to do then? Roll a wheelchair over like an a-hole? Come on. Stop that. I, I got to tell you, another thing that drives me nuts, just, oh, it drives me nuts. When someone else creates their own problem, and expects me to fix it for him. Mm -mm. It's not the business I signed up for. Just because you created your own problem doesn't make it an emergency on my part to have to work my butt off to bail you out, especially when it doesn't really concern me. Don't call me with those things, please. You want some assistance with, hey, you know what, I got an idea, blah, blah, blah. You know, a, a friend called up because they, uh, they own some rental properties and they're having difficulty with a renter. Not sure if they should evict them or what. So, you know, think about it, talk about it, come up with some ideas. Hey, here's an option where you can get everything you want without having to evict the people. And then when their term is up, their lease is up in another six, seven, eight months, whatever it is, you can send them down the road if you want then. But between now and then, you don't have to be out the money, the hassle of uh, a dirty house, maybe something that's wrecked and blah, blah, blah. I'm happy to help out with that kind of stuff when I have the time. I really am. But don't create your own issue and then expect me to fix it on your behalf. Or recently, I've actually been asked to break the law, to commit fraud. And talking about his conspiracy to commit fraud to help somebody out of a self-induced problem. No, I won't do that. I'm not going to break the law. I'm not going to break the law for you, that's for sure. I'm not going to have conspiracy to commit breaking this law for you either. Not to mention, other people know that you messed up. And if all of a sudden that mess is, well, no longer a mess, well, wait a minute. How did it become no longer a mess? Well, then there's all kinds of evidence to that, isn't there? Yet you're still asking. Please, folks, use your head. If you make a mistake, if you screw something up, step up and admit, you know what? You're right. I'm going to have to pay the piper on this one. It's on me. I got to fix it. 
rather than trying to make me the guy that's trying to help you get out of this problem, if there's any way possible, somehow then I'm being MF'd to third parties like I'm the bad guy. Dave, next time somebody <laughs> asks you for help, maybe just tell them, you know, hey, why don't you just kick me in the balls first? Just, yeah. right, just right in the jewels. And you know, the really funny part about this when I hear this um, from you is... And you don't know the details on the story I was just... No, I don't. To, yeah. But <clears throat> as long as I've known you, from day one I've known you, you have been the guy that if you can render any help to anybody, you will. Yeah. Um, so for somebody to abuse that by asking you to place yourself in harm's way, um, I mean, we're, we're not talking about... Now, look, there's some friends I have. If they called and said... Somebody did this to my daughter. Okay. Perhaps I'm going to risk going to prison. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> but short of something like that, uh, I think we share this paradigm. If I've gotten myself into a pickle somehow, my problem should not become somebody else's problem. Reach out and ask for some help is one thing. But to make it their problem? Yeah, and then Whoa. ask me, in this particular case, ask me to commit multiple felonies to help you up because you were too lunk-headed to think that you had to do what you needed to do, which is, oh my God, the most, literally, literally, <clears throat> somebody needed to write their name down. Okay. And because they didn't write their name down at the appropriate time and in the appropriate spot, they have an issue. And for me to go back and fix this is now they're asking me to commit felonies. Oh, no, no, to do this. no, no, no. When all you had to do while you were in a particular place at a particular time was write your name down. No, I'm not going to get involved in that. And just, just that anybody would even consider saying, and then now I'm the bad guy because I won't do it. Right. Right, I must have ulterior motives. Why I won't commit these felonies. <laughs> and you, other people are aware. I, 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 are. I, I'm not even the one that <laughs> discovered the problem. Someone else discovered the problem. And then we checked with a couple other people that should, I don't know, oh, is this true? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess that is unfortunate. So it's like I, I couldn't even get away with it if I was willing to do it. Right. right. So, and I don't know that there's anything within the law that can be done about this. And, so, and, and it's, not, it's not a massive deal if this person who forgot to write their name down uh -huh. has to buck up to the suds and, and take a swig of this right. crappy beer. But, uh, you know, you'll have a little bit of bitter beer face with it. But, you know, you got to do it. It's your problem, your fault. You did it. I'm trying to help. And, you know, when people spit in my face when I'm trying to help them, yeah. it makes me far less inclined to want to do a damn thing for them. <laughs> yeah. Like, Here's your life preserver in the form of a cinder block. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I've mentioned here that I've had some medical issues going on. Um, by the way, I'm going to miss a couple of shows. Uh, I think it'll be like the first show I've ever missed. I'm uh, having some medical procedures. Oh, you missed, you've missed a number of them when I wasn't there. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, the, there won't be a show because of me. I think they're okay. Um, but I've been having some, you know how insurance companies are. If they get something wrong in their computer. Actually, I don't because I've been a cash-paying medical okay. customer for 15 years. Well, let me tell you. But I'm sure even at take going outside of insurance, you know how this works with a big corporation. They get something wrong in their computer. Trying to get that corrected. Oh, yeah. Talk about an uphill battle. Oh, my God. And so, and of course, it's dealing with my health. It's like, what do you mean you're not authorizing this? These are like doctor's instructions, you know. I, I need this to move forward. And they're like, well, the computer says X. Well, the computer is mistaken. That's not factual. You know? And how is this not practicing medicine without a license? Right. How is that? Yeah, oh, to say God. no, the doctor ordered something, and no. Yeah. Well, what? So... You know, but even then, I've got some people on the phone who are at least supposedly trying to help me, right? You know, and even in that situation, I'm very clear with them. I'm not trying to make my problem your problem. Okay, it's just somebody needs to step up to the plate and fix this errant entry in the computer so we can move forward. You have the ability to do that, or should? Right, and and I if, don't. Uh, if I had the ability to fix it, I'd be down there taking care of it right now. Right. Give me remote access. <laughs> <laughs> Give me remote access to the NSA medical computer, and I'll fix it. And it's like if you're not if you're not the right guy or gal. Great. Who is? Transfer me to the right guy or gal. Let's get this fixed. But my point is, I'm not trying to make my problem their problem, which I think is what 
these people are doing with you. Yeah, they're trying and to make their problem your problem. I appreciate your, your statement. If I, can, if I can help out, I do. I'm just drawn that way. As a matter of fact, I, I found out just yesterday that uh, a friend of mine rolled his truck. Now, he wasn't in it. Um, oh, this he, has got to take talent. Yeah, it, well, he, he bought this, uh, this one-ton dually Ford pickup that needed some work. I know of whom we're speaking. Yes, I saw the social media posts yeah, on it. He has put <coughs> thousands of dollars into this truck to make it pristine, and he just finished. He, he just put the cherry on top with the $3,000 transmission and just got the last adjustments made, like, uh, about a week ago. Okay. Two days after that, puts a thing in park, Gets out to go look at something, and it starts rolling backwards out in the desert, and goes. It, it slips out of park, goes into reverse. Brake was not on. I, do, I believe was not on. Ends up rolling, barrel rolling down a hill. <laughs> so now this great, this like ten or eleven thousand pound dually quad cab pickup is barrel rolling down a hill. So it ended up on its side. It needed to be brought back up and bought up the hill. And I mean. I'm kind of a MacGyver of stuff. I've done a lot of off-roading, never been without a four-wheel drive. This sounds I like got... it might be beyond your MacGyvering. Well, no, but the thing is, is I, I, I found out yesterday that this had happened days before, and I kind of feel like nobody called and asked, asked me to help. <laughs> but they did ask a buddy of mine to help, who only lives a couple miles away from me. As a matter of fact, it, Ammo Supply Warehouse. Oh, Butch. Yeah, yeah, Butch Becker, who owns Ammo Supply Warehouse. Um, I may as well hit it now. I mean, I, I like to wear swag. He's, he's a good buddy. Yes, uh, good I've known him since he moved to town. Struggling guy then. Now he's got, uh, they sell ammo of all kinds and types, calibers, whatever, online. Um, and if you're local or if you're going to be here, like you're coming here for one reason or another and you want to pick up ammo, you can actually schedule a pickup time and go there so you don't have to worry about shipping. That's awesome. Yeah. So the warehouse is right here in Pahrump and they and, ship And he is right-minded. He really is, yeah. Very, very good guy. But anyhow, it was, it was his, uh, he's got a pretty badass Jeep. That he's got the, the big heavy duty, like 12,000 pound winch and like that. And so they tried to upright this truck with another pickup truck of nearly the same size and stature, and it wouldn't come. So they end up getting uh, Butch's Jeep and hooking up with the winch. Now, a Jeep doesn't weigh anything this is what in I'm comparison. Thinking, yeah. But because of the way that winches work with all the torque, they were able to get that truck right back on its tires. And then they, they uh, played hell moving a bunch of tires around so it would actually roll. He drove the truck. As a matter of fact, as it's sitting, after it rolled and it's sitting there on its side, the engine was still running. Uh -huh. Obviously, fuel injection, carbureted car won't do that. Right, right. Uh, you know, the bowls will empty. But he had to reach in there and turn it off. Once they got the thing upright, and then they, I mean, they were out all day long. All day and, and coming back, you know, later at night, uh, finally actually got the thing on the road and driving it back. Now I saw a picture, so I, I know that the that fiberglass cowling that covers the dually part was destroyed. How's the rest of the body? Oh, it's gone. It's done. Oh, yeah, that's... yeah, that truck is totaled. But for, I, I figured, visually. as you were saying, barrel rolling, I'm, I'm thinking total, but... The frame might be straight. If somebody could reskin the entire truck, <laughs> it'll probably be yeah. fine. I'm not sure that's going to be financially worth it. Probably not. So he's waiting on the insurance company uh, when I talked to him a couple days wow. ago. But and we'll be back. Enough, enough said. <laughs> Welcome back. This is segment four. This is where we go through... Your emails. You can always send those to Dave and Bill Show at gmail.com. We get them. As a matter of fact, mine comes right onto my phone and I can pull them up right then and there. Oftentimes I don't, <laughs> but sometimes I do. Remember, they have to make us look good. They, they do. They really have to help make us look good because <laughs> some of those things with the, like the goat, <clears throat> that goat thing. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 uh -uh, yeah. no, not, no. And stop sending that. It's the same guy, I'm sure. Anyhow, uh, from there, you can also go on to our website, which is totallyunprepared.info, and you can look up our shows, video, audio, what have you. It's all good. It's right there. That's our, our, our archive, yes. if you will. And if you're on Facebook, we also have a presence there. We do. Yeah, Totally Unprepared yep. on Facebook. Also, our YouTube channel. We're everywhere, man. Do we, have a, <laughs> do we have a Twitter account or anything? We don't. Do we? No, we, we don't, don't tweet. Snapchat? That's it, getting to be a big thing. It is. It's like, I, is I'm not like on it, but I guess I should Texting get on a picture. Yeah, my, my daughters are on it, right? So yeah. I know, that tells me I have no business being there. Now, I'm not saying this is going on with your daughters, but I know some young people who have talked to me about Snapchat. You know, one of the things I get along with young people pretty well, and 
uh, I've been told what they use Snapchat for. Because the thing about Snapchat is you send an image. Dare you infer any wrongdoing I'm just with you, my little princess angels. I'm just telling you how young dare, people are dare. using it. <laughs> I'm sure your children are the exception, but I'm just you saying. You know my children. They are the exception. They are wonderful kids. And I will la, 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 always believe la, la. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, let's talk about one of the emails we got. It's a, it's a news story that's breaking that is uh, basically the Third Reich come to America in the way of the FBI going to high schools and instituting a program where they're asking high school teachers to report any sort of anti-government sentiment, actions, or feelings, or statements by high school students. If they're not pro-government, we want to know about it. Now, this is, you know, in violation of the Reich. What is this? Yeah. It's ridiculous. You know, free speech, free thought, you know, I, agreement, disagreement, mm -mm. oh no, none of that. No, we want to know about it at the federal yeah. level. In, at the school level, right? Well, the, the schools are supposed to report it to the feds. Right, but my, my point is, you've got now teachers in the schools Acting as spies, agents for the, for the FBI. Yep. I, you know, it, it's just, but this isn't just a, a limited, a limited example. Um, Loretta Lynch's DOJ just filed charges. Oh, they actually already arrested the guy. Um, a what they're calling the new media. That would be guys like you and I, mm -hmm. not the old entrenched CBS, NBC, that thing. Um, a guy who's part of the new media concerning that whole thing um, up there in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And he encouraged armed people to come, but he was very, very clear. He said, I'm not saying come here to precipitate I re a problem. I remember seeing right. this. Yes. I'm not saying to come here and precipitate a problem. I'm saying come here and bring your weapons so we don't have another Waco. We don't have another Ruby Ridge. If the government tries something insanely violent like that, that we have the ability to stop that overreaching, okay, that needless violence. Um, he's now being prosecuted for interfering with the duties of a federal officer. Right. Um, and this, Which this is such a, one of those broad things. You know, there used to be things like uh, obstructing an officer or, or loitering. And a, a, number of, uh, a number of localities, uh, municipalities and counties, have ended up having to get rid of those laws because they were so abusive. If I've got nothing else to arrest you on, right. I'm going on one of these broad scope things and I can articulate within that broad scope. Yeah. Which those sorts of laws... Uh, if you read the founders' writings, those sorts of things were never supposed to be in there. Never brought, I mean, specific things. Right. So, interesting enough. Then we, we have a couple other emails that came in, too. You know, I'm sure this is a pet peeve of yours as it is with mine, although we've never talked about it before. Okay. I'm just going out on a limb here. Um, in war probable cause warrants the police officers file with the court, the use of the mechanism called, based on my training and experience... Okay. Now, for the audience who doesn't know, um, here's what will happen. A, a police officer will want a warrant to get into somebody's home or car, what have you, business, and they'll start articulating what they believe. And, of course, probable cause is a flexible, malleable concept, right? Um, to a point. To it's, a point, it's, right. It's slightly words, flexible. Yes, yeah, so one guy's probable cause may not quite reach probable cause to another yeah, mind. Okay. Yeah. So they'll start building their case to convince a judge that they have probable cause. This is for the audience. Um, and then I've noticed, I don't know when this started. Um, I never used it. But you see now, based on my training and experience, I know that or I can certify that criminals do this, that, and the other. Okay? And I once read, uh, I was sent by a criminal defense attorney a federal, in the federal system, a warrant that was uh, requested and, and given, but the request was made by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And it had about 22 points in the warrant. Three of them were material facts. The other 19, I'm sorry, yeah, the other 19 were based on my training and experience. And I went through those 19. Every single one of them, if you took the word criminal out and put law-abiding citizen, it would have been equally true, okay? Um, such as... Uh, based on my training and experience, felons often conceal firearms in their home. Okay? Based on my training and experience, law-abiding citizens often conceal firearms in their home. Right? Now, How many people have it hidden under that, the pillow, in a safe? That training experience needs to be so narrowly defined, because otherwise, if I were a judge, I would say, all right, I'm seeing this based on your training and experience, but I don't know what it is. So I'm going to need you to provide to me mm -hmm. copies of all of your training 
that you have had certified within this as it's appropriate to what you're talking about and your experience as well. I need to know about the experience as well. So I want to know, because if it's something like, based on my training experience, um, I believe this green leafy substance, which had a, a smell similar to that of a skunk, to be marijuana, then training and experience in that realm might work out. But based on my training and experience, you know, federal human nature issue. Yeah, human yeah. nature. It's like, okay, let's let's look at your training and experience. I need that articulated in detail. Yeah, based on my training experience, I know people with darker complexions have more melanin in their skin. <laughs> so, so does a high school kid know that? I mean, Based the, on my Wikipedia research, uh, yeah. I, you know, and the reason I bring this up is the Washington D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, that's the municipal department for D.C., has been getting warrants now, and it's suddenly come to the attention of the media. Um, based on nothing, no articulatable facts. They're submitting um, affidavits for search warrant based on nothing but based on my training and experience statements. And the courts are giving, the courts are handing out warrants in DC now like candy based on these, these uh, requests that have not one single articulatable hard fact. And it's, it's fully racist. It, it, it'll get up to a certain level yep. to, in the court system and it'll all be struck down. 279 warrants issued under this Paradigm, black defendants. Three white defendants. <laughs> Have you been to D.C. before? I, I know, but it's, it's still not 279 to three. Well, no, it's no. not. Yeah. And, and, you know, this has actually been a big thing in the uh, presidential races, the disproportionate um, number of minorities versus whites being uh, convicted of crimes that a similar percentage, a, dis, a disassociate percentage are being convicted and charged with crimes where a similar percentage are actually committing them. Like right. drugs. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Right. So then there was another thing. There was another thing that came in through the email of which I'm forgetting now, but there was a third one. I did this to you once Reasonable before. suspicion based on responding to radio calls? Yeah. Is that it? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so uh, somebody calls... 911 or the non-emergency number, right? And they report suspicious activity or it might be a crime. And it might just be, you know, I'm not sure what's going on here, but here's the deal, right? Or it might be a hoax. Right. Uh, it, it could definitely be a hoax. Like when I was professing last week, you should call in uh, the smog busters right. on, on all the government cars, <clears> right? <throat> it might be a hoax. So uh, you call into the police and you lay out whatever your story is. You talk to the 911 operator. It, it's generally that you're talking to a 911 call taker mm -hmm. or a non-emergency call taker. They then will send the information via computer, uh, shorthand over to the dispatcher. The dispatcher will then assign a priority level to that call based on what, it, what they're reading. Then they dispatch according to the priority, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes the dispatchers answer the phone in small departments. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Not often but it still happens in very small departments. So you've got third or fourth hand information going here. So what they're doing is, is the, um, the police are saying, well, based on the information I'm getting that came third or fourth hand from the call maker, right. that this is now reasonable suspicion for me to go and investigate some things. To, to detain somebody. To detain, yeah, detain yeah. somebody and, 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 and under an investigation. It should be clear that a detainment is, in legal terms, a seizure. I mean, the courts actually refer to a detainment as the, the seizure of a person. Yes. Okay? So you're telling that person, you no longer have your liberty to move about freely. I am taking that away from you now. And so you also which, know... Which, with real reasonable suspicion, the United States Supreme Court has said you can do that. Yes. Yes. So let's be very clear. But they've also put a limit <clears throat> on it. Yes. And the, the limit has said you need to complete your investigation in a timely manner. Right. You have no more than 60 minutes to do that. Right. Now, what they didn't say was you have 60 minutes to detain someone, and if that reasonable suspicion can be brought to probable cause, you can then arrest. Otherwise, you have yep. to let them go. You could log, long form it, let a detective look at it, or... You know, reinvestigate it yourself if more and information if comes. And but if your investigation is bearing more and more fruit, you can extend that. Correct. Yeah. But the thing is, is it's not that you have 60 minutes to do it. It's that you you have to do it in a timely fashion, but you have no more than 60 minutes. Right. And normally, I think the working number they're throwing out now in academies is 30 minutes, unless you have a damn good reason. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, but that's in an academy where we, right. we know cops are training cops, and 
But that, that's really been a downhill slippery slope. But the slope. idea, and some citizens are saying this, and sadly, even some cops that are supposedly trained and understand the principle of reasonable suspicion are coming out and saying, well, I got a radio call, so that's reasonable suspicion. I can roll up and say, you're, you're not free to go because I had a radio call. Yeah, which is not the case. Not the case at all. Um, the reasonable suspicion has to be known to the officer. It can't be like third hand somebody said. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that a person, if the officer believes the circumstances as he pulls up, what he's seeing and taking in justifies reasonable suspicion for a detainment, such as potential narcotics transaction or something like that. Sure. But just... With no other information other than the radio call, yeah. I'm going to show up and start detaining people who match the description of people that were provided to me in this radio call. Yeah. Yeah, no, it doesn't work like that. And, you know, the courts have, have ruled on this in the past. Yeah. But, I mean, how, how invasive of our constitutional rights, our liberties, and our privacy is it when people in general, but more specifically police officers, take the absurd position that I heard something in that little earpiece, so now you're not free to go. Yeah, that makes a little SS on the caller. Yeah, exactly. That's what it does. And we'll be back next week? The week after next. Okay. We'll see you then.